introduce Rishi Babasani. He's visiting us from Stanford, where he's doing his PhD with Percy Liang and Dan Jarowski. He works broadly on the societal impact of AI. I'm sure you know him as the first author of the Foundation Models paper, which was a large collaboration that he led with over 100 researchers, where they looked at this new, now standard paradigm in AI, where a small number of large pre-trained models have become the substrate for almost all of AI. But that was two years ago, which is an eternity in AI, and so <laughs> since then he's been working on a number of new and exciting things, and he's gonna, those are the things he's gonna talk about today. Over to you. Yes, thanks Arvind for such a wonderful introduction. So as Arvind mentioned, today I'm gonna try to talk about what I've been working on for the past couple of years, um, and try to cover broadly how I'm trying to think about the societal impact of these systems. Great. <clears throat> so this talk will have uh, four parts. Basically, I'm going to give a primer on some of the current events in the space of foundation models, and then use that to sort of situate my research on transparency, sort of introducing new concepts, and ultimately thinking about how we can drive change in the space. So as Arvind mentioned, we wrote this report uh, almost two years ago, um, trying to introduce the concept of foundation models and uh, conceptualize how it affects a range of different uh, disciplines and thinking about both the technological aspects, but perhaps even more importantly, the societal aspects. And that was in 2021. In 2023, I think a lot of the things we were thinking about then have panned out, but actually were largely wrong about the extent to which they've been impacting society. I think we made some underestimates there. And so I'm going to try to think about how rapidly this has affected society, perhaps well beyond what we anticipated in 2021. And this is a lot of the work I'm going to talk about today is uh, conducted at CRFM, the Center for Research on Foundation Models. It's a collective of over 300 researchers at Stanford, um, led by Percy, who's also my advisor, uh, in computer science, but bringing together people from over 10 different academic disciplines. And it's proven to be very influential in my PhD in particular because it has led me to do a lot of uh, collaboration with social scientists, amongst others. So, one of the things I wanted to start with, which I think we all have seen, and I don't need to behavior, is we've seen this kind of rise of generative AI in the past six to 12 months, and it's been powered by foundation models across a range of different modalities, models for text like ChatGPT, you know, images like Midjourney, code like Copilot, you, know, you have things for videos, audio, et cetera. Right? And I think what has been interesting to see is that these are not just new capabilities that we haven't seen in AI before, but they have real consequence and real utility, but also real harms. And I want to try to think about that as well in this talk. So to situate how I've been trying to think about foundation models, I want to identify four kind of key aspects where I think the space has evolved in the past uh, few months and few years. So one that I think uh, most people have sort of realized is uh, the notion of scale. That is, the resources required to produce these models, the size of the models themselves, is uh, far greater than anything we've seen before in AI. So in particular, this has amounted to a lot of the models being developed in industry, uh, as opposed to academia or in other sectors. And it has led to tremendous uh, capital being required to produce these models. So in 2022, which is where this figure from the AI index goes to, uh, the most expensive models maybe cost on the order of $10 million. Since then, we've seen this actually grow even more with models like GPT-4. Uh, and it's unclear, but you know, we speculate that it might continue to grow in the future. So that is a sort of sign of the cost or scale of these models. But a uh, related factor is the impact they're having. So the rate at which they have been adopted um, in society and just in general in various settings. Right? So here is a figure on stable diffusion, which accumulated basically at the fastest clip of any open source project at the time. Uh, a, you know, stars on GitHub. This is where uh, these models are, you know, this is a kind of repository for code. Since then, there's actually AutoGPT, which has been even more widely adopted in the uh, open source community in the past month or so. And then, uh, as many people know, ChatGPT is, uh, you know, has over 100 million active users, making it the fastest growing consumer application in history. So that has amounted to, and it has been caused by, in part, uh, tremendous investment, both into startups in the space. So in, in Q1 of this year, you know, over $10 billion have been uh, going into startups in the space. And perhaps more importantly, 
a lot of established companies, so on the right is a statistic from Accenture of a survey of global executives around the world uh, that uh, indicates that foundation models will play an important role in their corporate strategies. And this is a lot of established companies, major Fortune 100 companies um, are taking this on. So since I'm at CITP, I really wanted to also talk about what's happening in the policy space, right? Because there is a lot going on in the policy space. Um, and seeing as a lot of us have thought about AI policy for a while, it's interesting to see how rapid the kind of uh, interest has been in the policy space. And so I wanted to cover this across geographies. So in the UK, uh, they recently announced a task force that reports directly to the prime minister on the topic of foundation models, which involves both investment into compute in the UK and also resourcing for this task force itself, uh, probably amounting to over a billion uh, dollars. In the US, uh, we've seen a lot of attention to AI in general in the past month alone. Uh, I think one thing that's been interesting to see is um, members of the Senate have been thinking about what uh, should be done in terms of AI policy. Uh, so there, for example, is this uh, letter or a series of letters sent by Mark Warner, um, who's the chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, to a number of foundation model developers like Google and OpenAI and so on, asking for clarity on the security practices of these organizations. And so I think this is a new development as well. And because a lot of these models generate uh, content, you know, there's also uh, relevant things from the FTC earlier this week, um, and also the Copyright Office and, and beyond. In China, we've seen um, also discussion of uh, how generative AI will be uh, regulated or what um, proposed uh, legislation will look like there, um, which has also been interesting to see, especially with very specific guidelines on particular uses of generative AI. And then finally, in the EU, in the past uh, two weeks or so, we've seen developments on the EU AI Act of, in particular, updating the EU AI Act to have uh, sort of provisions or discussion of foundation models and general purpose AI. And, and I think it's still unclear what the final version of the EU AI Act is, but we're seeing policy developments there. So I think the point is that in the policy sphere, no matter in what geography we're looking at, you know, there are things beyond those four regions as well. Uh, I think there's been a lot of interest in AI policy. And I think this is worth paying attention to. Because again, the pace in policy in particular is uh, quite surprising. So in this talk, I'm going to try to focus on my broad sort of research agenda, which you can summarize into these three uh, sort of pillars of trying to make foundation models transparent. And I'll articulate what I mean precisely by that. From that transparency, then trying to introduce new concepts that become clear once things are more transparent. And ultimately, given these new concepts and new ideas uh, and old ideas, what should we do to change uh, the status quo? So to dissect the concept of transparency, I've really been thinking about it in two different ways. One is on the topic of evaluation, so how do you evaluate these models? I think this clarifies a lot of the capabilities and uh, weaknesses of these models, sort of providing numbers to concretize uh, how they work. But this is definitely not enough, and I'll talk about this as well. So how can we document the broader ecosystem that these models are situated within? And what do we need, in particular, for understanding their societal impact? What are, th what are the key bits of information that we need to make transparent to really understand what's going on? So this first work, Helm, is a collaboration led with Percy and Tony at the top and featuring important collaborations, uh, contributions from a number of other uh, folks. It's a year-long effort we conducted last year as a sort of first step to evaluate language models. Since then, uh, we're going to release a version that covers text image models and other modalities in the coming months. So one thing I wanted to talk about, which I think for most, most of us with AI backgrounds we're quite well acclimated with, is the challenges, but also the importance of benchmarking. Right? Benchmarking is a sort of central practice, not just in AI, but in other sectors that uh, we have seen uh, constant sort of iteration on over the field's history, right? So for Karen Spark Jones, one of the great luminaries of NLP, um, gave this quote that proper evaluation is a complex and challenging business, and over her career did a lot of work on evaluation. And I think her career and, and a lot of other work has shown evaluation is very uh, difficult to get right, but has this very central value, right? Implicitly, it codifies a lot of values, and implicitly, because people try to improve on benchmarks, dictates sort of priorities for the field at large. And so this is something we want to attend to, because what I'm going to discuss is us trying to build a benchmark. So how did we think about that? So we're going to concretely benchmark language models to start. 
So when I talk about a language model, I want to be somewhat precise about what I mean. So what I'm going to assume is that this is a model that takes in text and produces text, perhaps assigning probabilities to the text that it produces, but make no assumptions on how the model is built, um, how it is trained, et cetera. Um, and the reason I'm going to do this in part is practical. For many of the models evaluate, I don't know the answers to that. And also, uh, we're going to try to be agnostic to that so that we can you know, evaluate all of these models, including the ones that come out in the future. So to build the benchmark, these are the four primitives that I want to think about. So we're going to specify scenarios. These are roughly use cases for the model. Uh, these are going to be, you can think of them as sort of an abstract task, like question answering that you want the model to do, situated in a particular domain, for example, medical question answering or so on, and ultimately operationalized in a concrete data set. Given that sort of use case, then how do you actually use the model to, to perform this task? And, and be useful in this use case, well, we're going to look at a model, but we also need to sp specify this sort of wrapping around the model of how you're going to adapt it to that use case. right? And we've seen a variety of different approaches to adapting it, but the one uh, we most extensively study is how to prompt these models. And I'll talk a little bit about how we do that more precisely. right? So then, once you've taken your use case, run it through the model with this type of prompting, You've generated some behavior. You now want to evaluate this behavior. We're going to look at many different metrics for how to assess that behavior. Um, and I'll talk about why that's important as well. Right. So in the design of Helm, we thought about these three things. We first wanted to take a sort of top-down approach. Uh, this is in part because we've seen approaches arising concurrently with Helm that take more of a bottom-up bottom -up approach to language model evaluation. Here, we're trying to give this kind of holistic characterization, so we work top-down. From that top-down approach, we then figure out, given sort of top-down design principles, how do we operationalize them? And then ultimately, how do we execute an evaluation so that we can get results that are useful for the community? So the first part of this is the first principle we thought about is when we evaluate language models as opposed to other AI systems, it might be less obvious what the specific use case is, what the, you know, what are the kind of settings we should evaluate the model in, right? Because the models can be used for a variety of different things. So how do we even sort of think about the space of use cases, the space of desiderata we would have for them? So we go through a sort of exercise of trying to taxonomize both of those spaces. Um, and then given that taxonomy, because obviously we don't have the resources to evaluate everything, how do we pick a representative subset? right? And how do we importantly identify what we were unable to evaluate? right? So it's clear for the community and for ourselves and for everyone just what is uh, missing in Helm. Right? So for example, a thing I'm going to highlight here is a lot of the evaluations in Helm are in English. Right? Clearly, we should build language models for other languages. And there are language models for other languages. But to this point, we have not been able to evaluate them with Helm. Another factor here is once we have taxonomized things, one thing we want to do that I think a lot of folks in this room have in particular thought about is ensure that we evaluate models across axes beyond just accuracy. Right? In AI historically, and even at present, accuracy dominates all, you know, the existing evaluations in spite of a lot of different works in various sub-communities to highlight other kinds of desiderata. So in Helm, we're ultimately going to be able to evaluate models for seven sort of top-level categories, which are accuracy, calibration, so notions of models uncertainty, robustness, fairness, bias, toxicity, and efficiency. I'm not going to have time to delve too deeply into this, but if people have questions, I can talk about exactly how we operationalize these into concrete metrics, but I'm going to skip that for the sake of time. And we want to situate that evaluation in each of the different use cases. Why? Well, the way we interpret, for example, the relationship between accuracy and fairness in toxicity detection might be different from in mathematical reasoning. Right? The relationships and the trade-offs between metrics depend on the use cases in which they're situated. So, a way to think about Helm is to try to position it against other benchmarks that uh, have come up in AI. So I think the most widely seen paradigm in the history of AI, including at present, is a sort of paradigm of measuring the accuracy on a single data set. This is something like ImageNet. A lot of evaluations fall in this class. As we've seen you know, more work on representation learning, we've seen you know, things like superglue, an uh, analogs, and vision, and robotics, and so on, where now we evaluate the model on multiple data sets, but still primarily prioritize accuracy. And now in Helm, we're going to try to expand this along both axes. We're going to look at more data sets, but perhaps even more importantly, look at many metrics beyond just accuracy, as I mentioned on the previous slide. And then the final piece, I know this is uh, kind of blurry to see, but I'll, I'll try to make clear what's happening here, 
is we want to evaluate models under standardized conditions. And to think about this, it's useful to think about what was the status quo prior to Helm. Right? So to, prior to Helm, each of the columns of these two matrices are different models. So there are the 30 models that ultimately evaluated it in the first version of Helm. And the rows are different data sets. And the point in the top matrix is that it's very sparse because different models were evaluated sort of ad hoc on a set of data sets their creators chose. And this amounted to fairly uneven kind of coverage of the space. And in particular, it's difficult to compare the models on the same benchmark because they weren't evaluated on the same benchmarks. After Helm, we basically want to fill out the entire matrix. And for the most part, we were able to do that. And in general, we want to be able to sort of compare these models under standardized conditions. And this is kind of a goal we have been trying to advance even after the first version of Helm. So a final point I want to make, because it influences a lot of our decisions implicitly, is the notion of scale. We have finite resources. Uh, and we need to allocate them efficiently. And this is now especially relevant even in the context of evaluation. So in the beginning, I talked about the scale of training these models. right? But even the evaluation itself is now quite costly. This is just to run Helm a single time on the 30 models we looked at from 12 organizations amounts to a cost of about 40,000 USD. And in, on top of that, about 20,000 uh, A100 hours to evaluate all of the open models. right? So the for the commercial models, we have to pay the API uh, provider to use them. For the open models, we have to you know, run, the, you know, compute, uh, run the inference ourselves, and then therefore incur the cost of compute. So here are the 30 models we looked at in the first version. Since then, we've added about 10 more that have come out uh, since then. So Helm was released in November 2022. You know, there are lots of models coming out. So they came from these 12 organizations at the bottom. I want to highlight two things, or three things, actually. One, for the most part, the models are quite similar but they differ in two key axes. One is the size of the models. So the smallest model evaluated in Helm is about 500 million parameters, and the largest model is about 500 billion parameters, so about three orders of magnitude difference. And the other is the sense in which we have access to them, or the public in general has access to them. Right? So some of these models are fully open, so the weights of the models are open, and so they can be, uh, you know, assuming you have compute, queried by anyone. Some of these models are limited, usually in the sense that there is an API that you have to go through to use the model. And some of them are fully closed, in the sense, at least at the time, um, they were not available to the public. And so we had to convince the, uh, so this is the case for uh, Anthropic and Microsoft's models, we had to convince the developer to give us access for, for the purpose of Helm. And I should note that there, you know, there were other models at the time, for example, many of the models from DeepMind that we were, able to, were unable to evaluate in Helm, uh, because again, the lack of access. So I'm not, in this talk, I'm not going to focus too much on the results, in part because they've changed since Helm was released. Uh, if you want to see the results, they're on the Helm website, uh, maintained real time. Uh, but I wanted to highlight three trends that I found. Yes? One question for you, Ben. Yeah. Uh, the total queries, like, varies a lot. Total, total queries. Topic, topic, topic. Um, the total queries, I think. Uh, don't actually know the answer to that offhand. The total tokens, I could tell you the answer to, but I don't actually know why the total. They should be roughly constant. Um, but I think you're right. There is some variance. So I, I, I'd have to look into that. I don't know offhand. Um, great point. Yeah, and, and also I should have said the total cost is in different units and, and just fundamentally different because different APIs have different pricing schemes. And because of the model size, the amount of GPU hours required, required to query it will be quite different. Right? The larger models take uh, much more uh, compute. So the three trends I wanted to highlight are first, this kind of overall trend, which many people are interested in, of which models are most accurate, most fair, most biased, et cetera, or least biased. Um, and I want to highlight a few things here. One, so this is again from November 2022, so it's uh, since changed, is the most accurate models at the time were usually the model uh, text DaVinci 002 from OpenAI, um, Microsoft's very large model, TNLG, and Anthropic's largest model, um, at the time. One thing that's interesting is the very same models, and overall the ranking is very similar for accuracy, robustness, and fairness. Uh, we'll see this on the next slide, which is kind of interesting and different from what we see in, in other settings in AI. But also is very different. So the most accurate model is usually not the least toxic or least biased or most well calibrated. Right? So that means that when we're making decisions about which models to select in downstream use cases, often there is a legitimate trade-off. And we're trying to surface this by evaluating all of these different axes. 
So as I mentioned on the previous slide, and now it becomes clearer here, one thing when you evaluate at the scale is you can, you can do various types of meta-analyses. And one you can look at is how do different metrics relate to each other, right? So one thing we saw is that accuracy and robustness, the top center plot, and accuracy and fairness, the top right plot, and also robustness and fairness if you were to plot it, um, are very strongly correlated, right? So the accuracy-robustness relationship has been seen in many settings, including in computer vision, but the accuracy-fairness setting is often seen uh, as, a, as a trade off in other contexts. So it was interesting in, in this context for language models to see that they're fairly well correlated. Yeah? I, I was going to wait on this, but just to understand yes. this, could you tell us a little bit about what the fairness absolutely. metric is and what the robustness metric is? Just yes. Kind of right. Values. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So we looked at a few different uh, fairness and robustness metrics, but the ones that are being plotted are on the robust, they're both. So, so one thing to note is in the data sets we're looking at, we often don't have demographic metadata, um, which obviously complicates uh, how, how should you measure fairness um, or for most notions of fairness. Um, so what we do for both robustness and fairness is we're applying uh, perturbations to the original inputs in the test set. Right? So for robustness, these can be things like typos and so on. For fairness, um, we might be uh, swapping between different binary gender pronouns or other things like this. Uh, and then evaluating the model on, on these perturbed instances in addition to the original ones. Right? And um, the, the metric, I think, in both cases is the, the model would get you know, one point if it gets both the original instance and the perturbed instance correct and zero otherwise. So there are reasons to expect these to be correlated, um, just fundamentally as well. Yeah. So also, this should be, perhaps upshot on this is, this should not be taken to mean that accuracy and every notion of fairness are are correlated in the setting of language models. This is simply one notion that we actually measure. Just to understand your yes. fairness definition better, so if the model were totally insensitive to the pronouns, would it just definitionally lie on the, on the line? Yes. OK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and we, in the paper, you know, connect to different notions of fairness in the literature. But um, I'm going to skip that for a second. Um, one other point I want to make on this slide is this relationship between accuracy and in, uh, inference time, because I think it's definitely not the one we expected, and I think not the one most people intuit, which is I think most people intuit that the largest models will, in general, be the most accurate and almost necessarily be the slowest, so have the um, you know, largest inference time. So you expect to see some kind of uh, Pareto frontier or just the sense in which the two metrics are anti-correlated. Empirically, we don't really see this. And this is because there is a key confound here that we, we don't observe, which is that different models can have different amounts of compute put behind them that we don't observe. Right? For example, OpenAI's largest models might appear equally fast in terms of wall clock time as smaller models, because they have, they're allocating more GPUs to them. Right? So we have uh, future work that I think will come out in the next week or two that tries to, given this partial observability of how API providers and other actors uh, serve these models, tries to sort of infer what types of compute they're having. So you can get more useful measurements. Yeah. If you have this bottom right plot where you don't see the model, um, yes. then does it look more like a line? And also, does the inference time like, very much correlate with the Uh I think the second part is true. I don't know if I have, I think we could make the plot. I don't know if we've made the plot. But I think we've computed the correlation, and they're uh, strongly linearly or strongly correlated. I don't want to say linearly. Um, uh, to the first question, no, I think they're actually not. The size is doesn't. So you can actually kind of infer this. We, we talk about it in the paper too. Is if you look at the open models, which are a subset of these, one thing you'll see is within a model family, size is very strongly correlated with accuracy. For example, different model sizes of OPT from Meta, but across model families we find the relationship is, is not particularly strong between size and uh, uh, accuracy. Yeah. In addition to the size, do you have a measure of how much data the model was trained on? We have this for, I think, very few of the models. Yeah. And that's going back to your yes. thing at the beginning, this is the black box part of it. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, you could, you know, a more, you know, a thing you could also try to correlate, which we just have, uh, in fewer cases is the amount of compute put towards training the model or the amount of data used to train the model. In most cases, we were unable to get this. We were able to get more of the providers to disclose uh, model size beyond what was already public. But beyond that, we're unable to move the needle. 
And so a related thing um, is how do models pattern as a function of access? Uh, so we've sort of binned them into these three categories. So these are different data sets. Uh, and you could look at the same plot for other things, but I'm just going to focus on accuracy for this moment. Um, and what you see is that in, for most cases, the best, in the sense of most accurate, open, limited, and closed models are fairly close. For example, if you look at IMDB on the right. But there are cases, especially knowledge-intensive and reasoning-intensive scenarios, where they differ quite a bit. For example, truthful QA in the middle, um, where the closed and uh, API models tend to be quite better. Uh, and so this is worth paying attention to as researchers who, you know, in general, may not have access to these models. How do the findings we have on open models translate to other, other models that people are interested in? So that is uh, Helm. Uh, one thing we realized as we did Helm is we were trying to make things more transparent, and we did to, in large part. But it ultimately didn't cover a lot of things we thought were important for characterizing the impact. Right? Understanding the bias or toxicity or whatever of the model in isolation says something about the downstream impact, but is sort of an imperfect characterization. And even the notions of the capabilities of the models don't tell us how it will actually be used. So we built on Helm in this work called Ecosystem Graphs, where what we're going to do, so in Helm, we're evaluating the models themselves. Uh, what we're going to do is now try to document every piece of the pipeline to the extent we can. Right? So all of the data that goes into these models to the extent we can, um, the models themselves, and then ultimately the products that are uh, deployed to end users. Right? Because I think this is a much more useful characterization for downstream impact right? and is more relevant in, in a lot of contexts beyond sort of AI research. And so to situate this, I want us to think of this simple example of uh, stable diffusion. So this is the first version of stable diffusion. So how was this artifact uh, produced and used? Right? So uh, people on the internet and elsewhere produce data um, through various processes. Uh, then this data was curated into the Lion 5B data set by Lion, um, which is a derivative of actually the common crawl web scrape of the internet. From there, uh, stable diffusion was then trained on Lion 5B uh, by a number of different organizations, uh, and then adapted for this downstream use case, stable diffusion reimagine, which is one product um, uh, deployed by stability.ai. And they uh, deploy it to end users with uh, various uh, sort of safeguards of trying to block inappropriate requests and so on. Right? So this is a sort of simple life cycle of, of taking uh, data from the internet. Uh, using it to curate a data set, build a model, and then adapt it into a product. Right. And in fact, in this ecosystem that I'll, I'll show, you can see all kinds of interesting structures. Right. So there's the simple pipeline I talked about, where a data set is used to train a model, which is then deployed in a product in the top left. But you also see other types of things in the ecosystem. For example, products can build on top of each other. For example, a GPT-4 is used in Microsoft 365 Copilot, which is used in Word. Um, uh, products can affect models. For example, in a lot of retrieval augmented models, they might de uh, depend on a search engine. Or uh, you know, models can be adapted to produce uh, additional models. Right? So there are a lot of different sort of substructures in the ecosystem that you might observe. And so what we're doing is we're trying to document the ecosystem real time. Right? And so when I say that, what I mean is we're trying to document every data set, model, and product. Um, and when I say real time, you know, we're trying to aggregate information that is generally public um, from a range of sources. So this includes academic papers and so on. But especially for products, uh, you know, academic papers won't tell you much of anything about them. So we're looking at other sources, uh, like news reporting or other press releases from companies or so on, um, and aggregating that into a sort of centralized repository. So that's what we call ecosystem graphs. So for example, you know, this is a snapshot of you know, this, this slide is a bit old of uh, you know, models from you know, March 15th, uh, artifacts from March 15th uh, to April 4th. You know, there's a lot of stuff happening in this space. Right? Actually, if you look at the most recent snapshot, there are even more assets coming out. Um, and why would we do this? Right? So I think one of the key things we're interested in, in throughout this line of work is better uh, addressing the societal impact. Right? And how, you know, what that means differ, depends on which stakeholder you're thinking about. Right. For example, for a researcher, you might want to know, you know, how how are models scaling over time? What models exist? If you're uh, a policymaker, you might be interested in, for example, if there's pervasive dependence on the OpenAI API. If that goes down, what is the impact downstream? You know, if you're uh, 
you know, developer, you might want to know which uh, sort of video foundation models exist that are permissively licensed so that you can use them in your work. Um, and broadly, there are some you know, larger questions which the ecosystem graph doesn't answer but could help address questions of you know, what is the impact of specific organizations, who has power in the ecosystem, et cetera. You know, the ecosystem graph provides part of the you know, puzzle for addressing that. So the ecosystem is quite chaotic and large. Uh, so obviously, you can't see anything in this. So I'm going to zoom into one very small part of the ecosystem that I find interesting, which is these hubs that we've seen emerge. Right? So in many other uh, networks, we see hubs emerge. They've been well studied across many types of graphs. And in this graph, we also find them. For example, the ChatGPT API is a hub. I think many of us are not surprised to see that uh, because of its downstream impact. Right? And you can take an organizational view in, term, in addition to this kind of uh, technocentric view of looking at the, the model and the downstream product, uh, artifacts. You can look at how this creates a sort of organizational structure. Right? So there's a dependence on OpenAI across all these different companies. Of course, there's other dependencies that are not tracked in this graph. For example, there's a dependence on Microsoft by OpenAI because they provide compute, provide funding, et cetera. Um, but this uh, sort of structure is sort of interesting and is just one of the types of things you might see in the ecosystem graph. So I'm going to pause there, see if there are any questions on this sort of transparency section, and I'll go into the next parts. Yeah. How does the data get populated into that ecosystem graph? Is that being done by your team, or is yep. it like a wiki? So for the initial release, so we released it in March, uh, last, uh, well, two months ago. Um, that was all manual from us. Since then, there's a variety of different ideas on how to maintain it. So we'll do part of it, but obviously we neither, you know, we just want scale to the ecosystem. Yeah. Um, uh, so it is like a wiki; anyone can contribute. Uh, there is a review process to vet the information, um, uh, which we conduct. But the the contribution can be anyone. The other thing is we're trying to go to all the foundation model developers and get them to both contribute and verify all of their information in the ecosystem, right? As sort of centralized entities that you can. You know, have some reasons to be, uh, have some incentives for the information to be correct. We're trying to capitalize on that to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. So going to the next slide to follow up on that, and your point that you just made, or maybe it was the last slide on the ecosystem space. Yeah. Uh, now the one with uh, the networks. Yeah. This one? So <clears throat> given what you just described as your goal, mm -hmm. and looking at that chart, I'm mm -hmm. not sure that you actually Ah, right. So the, the people providing the information are, are open source contributors. They're not entity. Well, they could be entities in this graph, but they don't have to be. Um, I think a point you might be making is uh, right now all of the information is sourced from public knowledge, just currently decentralized public knowledge. Uh, one thing we have tried to make progress on, we just haven't made much, is you could get uh, these private entities who obviously know the true graph structure, they know what they depend on, to try to reveal that information. Um, I don't know if that's it, like try to be more transparent about their practices. Obviously, there are reasons that that's not particularly successful. But we are trying to an extent, if that's what you mean. Yeah, I want to Ah. Oh, no, that yes, that would be an interesting thing. Yeah, I, like, I think we. When I get to the policy part, that's also a thing we're talking about. Um, is is trying to get this to be more of a sort of. It's not clear based on what regulatory authority, but try to get this a, be a thing that's uh, tracked more real time for uh, mandatory reasons. So, okay, one thing I want to highlight is we, we spent this you know, effort trying to make things more transparent. Uh, that's great. What can we learn from this uh, transparency? Right? So I think there are a number of different use cases. I'm just going to talk about my own research uh, that tries to build on this. So one is a line of work we've been doing on the concept of algorithmic monoculture. So one way to reinterpret a hub uh, is, to, is it's a form of algorithmic monoculture. It's a form of pervasive dependence on, on a particular technical asset or algorithm. And so we wrote a paper last year, actually before uh, ChatGPT, uh, that tried to think about this because we sort of expected we would see this behavior, and currently we sort of see it. Um, so this is led by 
uh, is, is worked on with Katie Creel at Northeastern, Ananya, um, and uh, Dan and Percy at Stanford. So algorithmic monoculture is not a concept we introduced. It is one we're going to sort of uh, look at, which was introduced in a paper from John Kleinberg and Manish Raghavan uh, two years ago, where they defined it as different decision makers deploying the same algorithmic system. Right? And I'm going to actually give cases where that's what we see. But in many settings, we don't literally see that. We see different decision makers that deploy closely related algorithmic systems. Right? They don't literally deploy the same algorithmic system. But in particular, for example, they might deploy systems that depend on the same foundation model. Right? And what, uh, if anything, could we say about um, you know, what are concerns we should have in this paradigm? Right? So the most well-studied concerns about monoculture, both in agriculture and in, in the algorithmic and technical settings, are questions of resilience. Right? For example, if, you build, if all of your crops are corn, you're not resilient to certain pests that um, you know, might affect the crop. Right? Uh, so, and for example, if all of your chips are Intel, you know, if there's a, a vulnerability in those chips that might have pervasive downstream impact. Right? So that is a classic sort of concern in the case of monoculture. We wanted to ask, are there any further concerns, in particular concerns to individual people? And we're not the only ones thinking about this. A number of other people have been uh, trying to think about monoculture and, and its effects. So for example, uh, the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, uh, sort of gave this quote about you know, this notion of concentrated risk, if we're depending on the same technical assets. Uh, and MIT's Alexander Madri um, has been writing a sort of series of works with his students on um, this kind of emerging AI supply chain, and in particular, dependence on a, a small few actors and assets. So the harm we wanted to introduce in this work, and I'm going to talk about some empirical stuff related to it, is the harm of uh, homogenous outcomes. So let me try to explain what I mean by that. So consider this setting. So I'm going to actually give a setting that's not about foundation models. Uh, you know, the work we looked at looked at it in the foundation model setting, but I think there are actually even more uh, severe instances that are already present in society. So I want to kind of focus on these uh, and not just foundation models. Right? So Consider the setting where people apply to jobs. Right? In most cases, people apply to many different jobs at the same time. Right? So for example, consider this applicant applying to three different banks. So they might send in their resume, and each of the banks needs to make a decision of whether to interview the candidate or not, and ultimately to hire the candidate or not. And so how could those decisions be made? So I want to consider two perspectives. The first one, uh, the one towards the center, which has been the status quo for a long time, uh, and the one that we now see as, as uh, closer to reality in many cases, given the rise of algorithms and hiring. Right? So historically, uh, different decision makers at different companies, for example, different hiring managers, might have influenced or made that decision of, should we interview this candidate? And ultimately, should we hire this candidate? Right? Now, with uh, hiring algorithms, the status quo is that many of these uh, Employers will purchase hiring algorithms from the same few uh, vendors and therefore depend on the same vendor, or uh, let's just say the same vendor, to produce the hiring algorithms that these different employers are now going to use to make hiring decisions. Right? And what is different? Well, the key difference that I want to highlight here is we might have other concerns about equity in this process, algorithmic fairness, et cetera, uh, with the introduction of this algorithm. But I want to talk about the structural change. right? Before, different people, different decision makers, with their own biases, idiosyncrasies, et cetera, made that decision. Now, potentially, the very same algorithm makes that decision. Right? And so the concern is that the candidate will receive the same decision, whether it's being rejected or being hired, from all three. Right? And so that homogeneity is the thing we want to attend to. Right? So a point I want to foreground here is there are reasons that we should already expect homogeneity in the labor market independent of algorithms. That's absolutely true. Uh, so I'm not making a claim at this moment that it's exacerbated. That's certainly a thing I think is possible. But I'll just tell you what our evidence is about uh, this, and, and we can uh, draw whatever conclusions you make. So uh, in ongoing work, we are trying to actually study algorithmic hiring. Uh, so we have a data set of about 4.5 million job applications. These are real job applications um, made by about a million and a half people across the world, um, where these uh, applications were mediated by a hiring algorithm, the same, uh, uh, by the same hiring algorithm provider. Right? And this is joint work with 
uh, Sarah Banna um, at Chapman University, Katie uh, again at Northeastern, and then Connor, Dan, and Percy at Stanford. And uh, to sort of get a sense of the scale here, um, you know, the companies, who, the employers who are going to make decisions based on these algorithmic decisions um, are quite varied. They range across most sectors of the economy, um, and they're fairly large in nature. So these are fairly large companies. Um, so many uh, recognizable companies are, are clients of this algorithmic hiring provider. And what you see is a very clear, yes? Uh, we're getting it directly from the uh, hiring algorithm provider. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, happy to answer any other questions on, on the data. Um, but the key thing I want to highlight is just how homogenous outcomes are. Again, I'm making no claims that this, because I can't, that this is more homogenous than human decision making. I just want to make the claim that outcomes are very homogenous in this setting. Right? So what are we looking at? This is a figure of looking at only candidates who applied to 10 jobs. Right? So candidates who applied to 10 jobs can get anywhere from 0 to 10 interviews, or conversely, 0 to 10 rejections. So in particular, what do they get? Well, a lot of them get uh, no rejections, so 10 interviews, or 10 rejections, or no interviews. Right? So about 25% of the mass is on the two extremes. We have some other data um, from earlier, uh, from like the early 2000s, where economists have sent out fake resumes to different companies. In those settings, we don't actually see this type of extreme homogeneity. Right? We see, for example, a mode closer to one or two. So many people receive one or two job interviews and not 10 or 0, and you know, an, another mode on the other side. But you don't see this uh, tremendous you know, mass on the two extremes. So things are homogenous. Um, and in fact, they're guaranteed to be homogenous. Right? So uh, I haven't said too much about uh, this algorithmic hiring company. But um, one thing uh, they do is for their clients, they offer two different options. One option is that they can use an industry-wide model. So for example, pretend you're to consider two different uh, hotels, Hilton and Marriott. They might choose each independently to use the same industry-wide model for the hotel sector, um, in which case candidates uh, evaluated by these two models will get, uh, by these two employers will get the same decision because it's the same underlying model. It's literally guaranteed that they'll get the same decision. Or they might uh, customize the model for Hilton and Marriott, in which case the decisions may be the same, but they're not literally guaranteed to. What you see is actually, in many cases, candidates are applying to companies under the uh, false belief that they can get uh, um, different outcomes from these employers. For example, if you look at candidates who apply to 20 jobs, they're actually, on average, only evaluated by seven models. Right? So they're applying to 20 different companies, expecting it to be possible that you know, different companies will make different decisions. You know, on average, there's only seven underlying models uh, that will contribute to that variation. Right? Or if you look at another data point, when people apply to two jobs, uh, on half of the time, they're evaluated by one model across those two jobs. So they're guaranteed to get the same outcome. And half of the time, they're evaluated by two models. So they're, you know, it's possible they'll get different outcomes. Yeah. Yes, this is the specialized versions of that uh, hiring. So this is all with there's only data from one uh, hiring vendor. Okay. This is that hiring vendor for a particular client might specialize the model or not. Um, in many cases, they do not. So why does that tell me about the number of algorithms that an applicant would experience when sending out their application? Uh, so I, I'm uh, maybe I'm saying. So for this hiring algorithm, like if you apply to 20 jobs that are associated with this hiring algorithm company, uh -huh. you will, on the back end, be evaluated by seven models on average. Good. You, you, you beat me to the next slide, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain <laughs> it on the next slide. Um, but yes, they get binary decisions. It's not relative. Yeah? 
this is very opaque. We're trying to get those statistics. I don't know the answer to that. Of like, I think what you're asking is what fraction of applications go through a hiring algorithm of any kind, and in particular, the ones produced by this company? Is that roughly what you're asking? I don't know those. Yeah, so I don't know the market share statistic. I do know a different statistic, which is perhaps helpful, which is, um, and this is a very contentious statistic, so there are different estimates of it. But uh, we've seen claims from anywhere from 50 to 90% uh, of jobs in the US are mediated by a hiring algorithm. Now, the reason I say that's contentious is because people have different definitions of hiring algorithm and different sources of that information. Um, but I would say a large fraction of jobs are mediated by hiring algorithms. I just don't know the fraction this company contributes to. Yeah. Uh, so when you said binding, yeah. does that mean that this is like a filter that you know, they're just eliminating you know, what is uh, some part of the applicant that they want to exclude them, and then the rest of the time is filled, or is this like a filter? Yeah, so how do the clients make use of these uh, rec like recommendations? So, um, they're framed as recommendations, um, as we recommend or do not recommend the candidate. Um, in talking to their teams, uh, I think most clients choose to reject all of the not recommended candidates and keep all of the recommended candidates. But obviously, we'll do further filtering of the recommended candidates. Great question. So this company is very interesting. Uh, so their claim is that resumes uh, sort of reify sort of structure uh, hierarchy in society. And so in particular, don't capture soft skills. I'm just telling you what they claim. You can make of it whatever you may. Um, uh, they, so they have candidates play games online. So the features to this are online games. Um, Again, you can make of that whatever you may. So the, the company might have a different model that d handles these gameplay features differently, but the, the features are gameplay specific. Does that, does that matter for any of your claims? Like, it does seem like it's an unusual This is a, so I think part of it will be the answer to the previous question of like what for market share does this have? Yeah. I do think uh, anecdote, like I think they're unusual, like I wouldn't say that this necessarily is what we see for other hiring algorithm providers. It's not even clear that this is actually the biggest delta though. This is one delta. But I think other hiring uh, algorithm providers uh, by default screen more vigorous 